Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this class in our series, Wonderful, The Mighty Works of Jesus. As we've gone along through our studies, we have found the Lord's uh, mighty works to illustrate not only who he is, but that he cares, that he's able to bless the lives of people as, we, as he's allowed to do so. Uh, and, and that he addresses uh, needs in life that all of us feel. I tried to go back in my mind to think of some of the ways in which these mighty works we have surveyed have, have impacted the lives of people. And if you think about it, we find the Lord um, using his power to make a difference in the lives of people who are caught up in the raging uh, what we would call natural elements and and people who are suffering the pain and the difficulty of uh, debilitating illnesses or sicknesses of some kind or of uh, oppressing unseen forces, whatever they might be in, in life, of the pressing needs just for things like food and, and uh, to be able to live every day. Uh, heartbreaking loss. Uh, the Lord has shown himself able to address uh, exhausting effort with little progress and the discouragement that that brings. Um, uh, he, he's able to supply. He has shown uh, what re is required when people are trying to voluntarily serve and, and, and meet responsibilities in life. He has dealt with isolating loneliness that people have endured. And we'll find him in our class tonight um, showing himself capable of mighty works uh, at mighty moments in the Lord's ministry when his hour comes, uh, when he looks to be at the weakest, most humiliating point anyone could be, there are still some mighty works which occur at that time uh, done by him for important purposes, I think we'll discover. Remember last week in our study, we pointed out here's Jesus moving on toward Jerusalem. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And we saw what he did for the 10 lepers as he was on his way. Well, he gets to Jerusalem. And during that mighty week, when there are events that surround what we would normally think of as uh, his death and burial and resurrection or his passion, you'll, you'll hear it referred to, there are, interestingly to me, uh, three mighty works done by him surrounding, in the moments surrounding these things for which he came into the world. It's interesting to contemplate the meaning of these uh, works of the Lord. There are three of them that we'll call attention to uh, in our few minutes here together tonight. First off, there is a, a mighty work which expresses judgment. Uh, it's, the, it's known as the, the curse that he placed upon a fig tree. We read of it in Mark chapter 11, uh, starting at verse 12. It's also recorded in a shorter way in Matthew 21, beginning at verse 18. Here is a, a moment which causes us to stop and think about the fact that the Lord cares about what our responses to his mighty power are and which causes us to realize no one can have the power to do these, these mighty things, these, these uh, wonderful things to make a difference in human experience uh, in a positive way and not have the power uh, that has consequences when it's simply ignored or when it is rejected. Uh, here in, in this moment, it's during the final week. The Lord has gotten to Jerusalem and he's been welcomed and he's gone into the town and he's looked through the temple to see what uh, is going on, what's being done there in his father's house or in his house, he'll call it. And you notice that 
in Mark's record, it appears uh, that this happens on the Monday morning of that week as he comes back into the city from where he has been staying during the nights with his friends. And, and here we find out, verse 12, on the following day, as we said, the Monday morning, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. Now, it might help to stop and, and think here that a fig tree in leaf should have had at least the beginnings of some fruit on it, according to what, what we can learn about uh, uh, the, the, the tree and, and the way it, it, its fruit was produced. He said to it, may no one ever eat from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now, at first thought, it looks like that sort of a petty kind of a response, but you have to remember that Jesus is teaching his disciples still that they are grappling with and not understanding yet the full implications of, of what are, is about to happen with the one that they have confessed to be Christ. And it helps to understand here that there is an Old Testament background to the imagery used here. The fig tree was one of the symbols which, symbols which, was u, which uh, is used by the prophets to represent the people of God and what, they had, what God had done for them and how they had responded to God's care and God's blessing. Uh, the fig tree and the fruit it should have borne uh, stood for the people and the fruit in life they should have produced having been uh, benefited in so many ways by God and his covenant with them. Well, they should have, the fruit should have been even more so given the arrival of the Christ, the son of God and his efforts to appeal to them and to help them and to bless them, but they are in the process of rejecting him. The authorities are already determining how they are going to get rid of him, and the appeal that he has been making to come to him, all who are weary and are heavy laden, is being rejected in the place where it should have been welcomed most in a town where the children and the crowds have cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The authorities, the leaders of the people are saying, make them hush, make them be quiet. Don't let them say that. There's no fruit uh, which should have been found. And so Jesus goes on into the city and he cleanses the temple uh, from the money changers and the, the, the things that were happening there, overturning their tables, driving out their anim, animals and so forth. Um, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You've made it a den of robbers. And he, he cleansed all of that. There, that's not the fruit he was looking for. And then it says, as they passed by in the morning, this would have been the Tuesday morning of that week, so just a couple of days before he ends up being betrayed and arrested, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Now, here I want to stop and, and, and actually look at an Old Testament illustration of this and what this would have meant and, and according to their scriptures. The prophet Hosea, for example, in Hosea chapter 10 at verse 9 uh, has the, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, chapter 9, verse 10, uh, has in it the image, God saying of the people, like grapes in the wilderness, I found Israel, like the first fruit on the fig tree in its first season, I saw your fathers. They should have been just getting ready to to bear more fruit and more fruit and more fruit and to be a blessing and God brings them and plants them in the land. But what happens is they turn to idolatry. 
they turn to the disgusting idols of the Canaanites or uh, of idols by their own new design. And, and, and God, has, God shows uh, through this prophet how that unfaithfulness hurts him, grieves him, and what happens to it. And so the, 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 the passage goes on until we, we come down to verse 16 of Hosea chapter 9. Ephraim, standing for Israel, the northern kingdom, is stricken. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Well, that's exactly the kind of imagery Jesus is using to communicate to his disciples and to the nation the consequences of their faithful, faithlessness to the covenant of God. They have not borne the fruit of godliness uh, that they should have or the fruit of love for God or faithfulness to the covenant that could have been rightfully expected by the Lord. And that has consequences in their lives. That's what he's trying to save them from. That's what he's come to try to rescue them from. But they've not wanted rescue. Now, the disciples want to know, verse 21, Peter re remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, teacher, look, the fig tree that you placed the curse on has withered. And Jesus said, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, and he goes ahead to talk about this mountain. If you say to it, be thrown into the sea, you don't doubt in your heart. You believe that what it says will come to pass. It'll be done for him. Keep this in context now and remember that the Lord is trying to teach his disciples about the fruit that is uh, meant to be the result of his blessing and the, of his mighty works in the lives of his people. And he's telling his Peter and his disciples that if they will walk by faith and if they'll not doubt and rebel against God, they'll, he'll supply what they need to bear the fruit that should be born in the lives of servants of the Lord. And if we think of this mighty work in that way, we can, we can imagine some of the impact that it might still be meant to have for us. The Lord's mighty blessings in our lives should produce good fruit, good fruit to the glory of God, good fruit to bless people's lives, and, and not simply to, for us to selfishly flourish with wonderful leaves but of appearance, but no godly substance in our lives. A second one of the mighty works of Jesus that happens during this last week uh, occurs on the night the Lord is arrested. You remember the long farewell discourse, the observance of that last Passover meal, the institution of the Lord's Supper, the great conversation of John chapters 14 through 16, the prayer of John 17, the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane or the prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane in which the Lord finally says to the Father, your will be done after, in, in the middle of his great agony. And then Judas comes leading the mob out to arrest him. If you remember that what happens here is Jesus goes, according to John's account in John 18, uh, out to meet them and ask them three times who they're looking for. When they tell him Jesus of Nazareth, he makes them repeat it twice. He answers each time with the I am. I am he, but I am is the phrase. And it would call attention to the people who were familiar with the law, with the Old Testament, to the I am of God. And notice the courage, the voluntary meeting of this situation on the part of Jesus, the self-giving identity that he does. He asks that his if they're seeking him, then his disciples should be allowed to go on their way. He's doing this 
himself. He's doing it for them. He's doing it for us. He's not a martyr. He is, even though he has this mighty power, he's giving of himself. Well, Luke tells us that at this moment, Luke 22, verse 47, beginning, um, um, the disciples who have been wondering about their proper response to this situation act on their own. Um, uh, while the, when the crowd comes, Judas, one of the 12, leading them, Judas draws near to kiss him. Jesus said, Judas, would you betray the son of man with a kiss? How, how, how ugly that kind of uh, uh, betrayal is. And, 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 and when those around saw him, saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And, and one of them, without waiting for him to answer, you notice, and John tells us this is Peter, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. John tells us that this servant's name is Malchus. And you can imagine Peter drawing the sword in that darkness and swinging for the guy's head and the guy moving over and it gets his, it gets his right ear. Jesus said, however, no more of this. Matthew tells us that he said that whoever uh, lives by the sword will perish by the sword. And John says he told them to put the sword up. Uh, Matthew tells us that Jesus also said to his disciples, don't you think that I could call 12 legions of angels and they would be sent? But then how would the scripture be fulfilled that it must be so? Again, Jesus realizes what is happening here. And Luke tells us he touched his ear, the servant of the high priest who is coming to arrest him, Malchus, and healed him. It is a wonder that this is done. It's a wonder that there are not more details about it. It's a wonder uh, whatever happened to this fellow after this, at this moment, he, the Lord healed his enemy or the one at least was serving his enemy. Jesus said to the chief priest and the officers of the temple and the elders who had come out against him, have you come out against us as against a robber? Have come out as against a robber with swords and clubs. When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. You notice here the power of Jesus is present in this situation, and what happens to him is not due to weakness on his part. He's not being defeated, and yet. He's not simply reacting to the hate and the ungodliness that's, that's uh, coming out to arrest him. He still is uh, in, in control enough to bless and to do what needs to be done in, in that way. He's willing to drink the cup of judgment. John says, John 18, verse 11, not because he has to, but because it was his father's will as he had been praying. Oh, that I had that kind of commitment to the father's will or so that kind of submission to it. Uh, so here are these first two mighty works. One of them expresses the Lord's judgment where there should have been fruit, but after so long a time, there was none. The second one expresses the Lord's willingness to be a blessing even to his neighbors, or to his enemies rather, and to teach his disciples that the nature of his kingdom is not earthly violence or attack. The third one of these mighty works happens after the Lord is raised up again. It's fascinating on its own, but this one shows us 
that after all of this happens, his death and his burial and his resurrection, he's still the same Jesus and that he still is able to be with his disciples and to enable them to do what he's called them to do and us to do what he's called us to do. What happens is after his resurrection and the appearances in Jerusalem, he goes back to Galilee that the disciples do where Jesus has told them to go meet him. In John 21, beginning at verse 1, it says, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, another term for the Sea of Galilee. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, in other words, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I go fishing. That's akin to saying, I'm going to work. They said to him, we'll go with you. That night, or they went out and got into the boat, and that night uh, they caught nothing. Fruitless toil, hard work, no results. It reminds us back to Luke chapter 5, where they had fished all night another time, and the Lord had told them to put out into the deep and cast their nets out, and they did, and they caught enough fish to fill two of their boats. That's when Peter had said, Depart from me, O Lord, I'm a sinful man. And Jesus had said to him, uh, Henceforth, you're going to be uh, fishing for men. Well, uh, this, what's about to happen here is, is as if to say, Peter, do you remember that other conversation? All right, now it's time for the work I told you you would be doing back then. So what happens here is just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat. Now here's a guy on the bank talking to guy who's, guys who've been working at this all night. And you'll find some, it say, he says. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved, we think that's John, therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. Uh, in this event, there was the recall of what had happened before, and it's the Lord. And the Lord's ability to say it, it is, it is what has blessed us in this way. When, when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put off his outer garment and threw himself into the sea, and he, swam, he, he, he went to the Lord, and the rest of them come to the boats. And when they get there, they find a charcoal fire already made with fish being cooked and bread being baked uh, there at the fire. And Jesus took, uh, has them to bring some fish that they have caught, and they... They sit down and uh, Jesus takes bread and gives it to them and so with the fish. These are disciples who might have remembered a time when Jesus had provided bread and fish for a whole crowd of people and then had entered into a conversation with the people about who he was and about what it would mean to depend so wholly on him that his body and blood would be involved. And the people, if you remember, had murmured over this and had walked away and had been uh, so uh, um, in wonder at these hard sayings that uh, they started 
getting fewer and fewer and fewer until there was hardly anyone left. At John 6, verse 60, it said, many of his disciples heard what Jesus was saying. They said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that the disciples were grumbling like this about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Well, when Jesus provides this meal on the shores of the Sea of Tiberias, it wouldn't be long until he would be doing this. What would they say then when they couldn't really see his physical presence anymore? Remember back then the conversation had developed. Many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. John 6, verse 66. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. It's almost as if this mighty work here, which tells them how to fill their nets up with fish, is inviting them to reaffirm that even after his death on the cross, his burial, and then his being raised up again, are they willing to reaffirm that commitment to him? And are, are they willing to extend it, to devote their lives to extending that conviction into the lives of other people? That's the thought-provoking impact of this mighty work. So even during that last week, one says there's consequences for how we respond to this kind of power and goodness. Another says, I'm here to bless people's lives, not to destroy them. My kingdom is a spiritual one and not one that is promoted by power and force and violence. I'm giving myself. I'm not being simply killed. And the third one is, all right, I have overcome, but I'll be ascending to my Father's right hand. Are you willing to extend my spiritual rule into the lives of heart and hearts of people by convincing them that I'm the Holy One and I have the words of eternal life. That's the impact that the Lord's mighty power is meant to have. Now, what, those, what these three mighty works mean is that the other mighty works we have been studying, the wonderful things the Lord has done, can become present in our lives now through the gospel of Jesus Christ, not in the doing of the same kind of mighty works he did, but in being benefited by who he is. In Acts 2, beginning at verse 22, the mighty works of Jesus are used to illustrate that he was uh, the son of God, that God approved of him and what, what he did. And it wasn't possible for death to hold him and that he's the Christ and that his name, we can repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. The apostles went out in Acts 14 and verse three and they, they, they spoke the gospel of the kingdom and God bore witness to the word of his grace by mighty works and signs and wonders which he did through them. But all of these are always inviting us to be a people who enjoy the benefits of the gospel of Christ and who live under his rule. In Ephesians chapter one, there's one of the great blessings, the great prayers of Paul that that I think would be appropriate for us after we have surveyed these different kinds of mighty works. I'd like to conclude this series with you. Thank you for, for reading along with us as we've looked at these events, but I'd like to just close by the reading of Paul's words here. 
Ephesians 1, beginning at verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward you who believe? According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right, his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that's named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And then at the end of chapter three, now to him who's able to do far more abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us.